Welcome to Vegan Business Talk with Katrina Fox, author of Vegan Ventures, Start and Grow an Ethical Business. Hello and welcome to episode 143 of Vegan Business Talk. I'm Katrina Fox, journalist, author and PR consultant, and founder of Vegan Business Media, a content events and training platform providing success strategies and resources for vegan business owners and entrepreneurs. Firstly, a quick announcement. I get a lot of people contacting me asking how they can work with me. So this is a little plug to let you know that I offer a range of services to vegan and plant-based business owners and entrepreneurs. From online training and group coaching to PR, content creation and copywriting services and one-on-one tailored individual private consultations. So if you're wanting help to promote or grow your vegan business, brand, product, service, book or other creative project, head over to veganbusinessmedia.com and click on the Work With Me menu link for more details. Now for the main part of the show. In this episode, I interview serial social entrepreneur Sonali Figueres, the founder and editor-in-chief of Green Queen, an award-winning impact media platform advocating for social and environmental change in Hong Kong, with a mission to shift consumer behaviour through inspiring and empowering original content. Green Queen began as a blog and is now currently Asia's largest plant-based media platform. Sonali is also the founder and CEO of Eco Warehouse, a global sourcing platform for certified organic products with a mission to make safe quality food accessible and affordable for the whole planet. With over a decade of experience in publishing, digital marketing, organic trade and health and sustainability, Sonali is an eco wellness industry veteran with a keen eye for market trends. She's also a sought-after international speaker and moderator, sharing her expertise on stages across Asia and beyond, including TEDx and Harvard Business School. In this interview, Sonali discusses how she grew the audience for her blog and turned it into an award-winning impact media platform, how she monetized Green Queen to make it sustainable, how Green Queen and Eco Warehouse have been funded to date, why she's not a fan of the gig economy and chose to employ her staff and provide benefits to them, why she's taken the approach of publishing mostly original editorial content rather than advertorial or sponsored posts, what she looks for in a pitch that makes her say yes to running a story, and much more. Here's the interview with Sonali Figueres from Green Queen and Eco Warehouse. Hello, Sonali. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Katrina. I'm super excited to be here all the way from Hong Kong and you're in Australia. Yeah, exactly. I love the the use of modern technology that we can connect like this. So I'm delighted to have found out about you fairly recently, even though you've been doing some amazing things. Uh, You're a a wonderful serial entrepreneur in the sustainability field, and we're going to talk a little bit um, about that. But you've got a very diverse um, professional background. Um, I think you've managed a, a fashion retail store, international wealth manager at a major bank. Uh, You've done risk and research analysis and digital marketing and publishing. Um, And of course, now you're the uh, founder and editor-in-chief of Green Queen, which is a fantastic um, platform. I think it's Asia's Asia's largest uh, English-speaking plant-based media platform. And you're also the founder and CEO of Eco Warehouse, which we'll talk about a little um, as well. But first of all, I always like to ask people, what is the why? So what are your reasons for doing what you do now? And just talk us through a little bit about how you kind of ended up here in this sector. Absolutely. So I think from my what is why is probably a little bit different than how I ended up here. But basically, I, I feel there are so many things in the world that need fixing. And I feel that in uh, sort of the the quote that kind of best defines my day to day is the only way out of darkness is to serve those without choices or voices. Oh, I like that. So that's 
that's sort of my motto and that's what I practice. So I feel that I get out of bed every day with a purpose to really create impact for those who need it the most um, because I feel that I have many um, privileges in life. I'm educated. I have a wonderful family. I'm safe. I have food and, and shelter that is consistent and I have a duty to serve those that don't. And that for me is the only way to fight what would otherwise probably cause me severe depression, which is the awareness of everything that hurts in the world, whether it's our broken food system or, you know, the rampant human rights abuse that is everywhere, or the fact that, you know, sometimes it just feels like everyone is incredibly selfish and we need to be kinder and better. And so the only way I know how to find my way is to serve. And I do that the best way I know how, which is through business and through now media. And to answer your second, the second part of your question, it all started because of health problems, (laughs) which I feel is quite a cliche in the health and wellness world. And, 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 and maybe this is Sadie Leroux, but basically I spent many years from when I was a teenager to when I was about 25 that with very chronic health conditions that allopathic medicine were not able to fix. And so eventually I had to sort myself out. I happen to have two illnesses that um, are not curable. So I have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Oh, and I have Sarah, endo- I've got that as well. <laughs> So you know, yeah. um, and I, I have endometriosis as well. And so both of these are diseases that don't have a cure. Uh, pharmaceutical companies are not interested because they can't sell us a drug. Um, they affect women disproportionately more than men, um, which means less research, less money, less attention. And they require a ton of kind of lifestyle management, which I didn't know at the time, but, and it took me years to get diagnosed and it took me decades for doctors to take me seriously. And as such, I have a very, I feel, uh, fair, fairly founded fear, uh, not fear, mistrust of doctors. And I, I do often feel like they're just not, they're not there for you, especially as a female patient. Um, at the same point in time, I feel doctors play an incredibly important role and I respect them greatly, especially right now. But I had this sort of very difficult um, journey with my health and all these things, because a lot of these lifestyle diseases and these hormone-based diseases, they, they make life very difficult without being life-threatening. So of course, it's, it's hard to get people to understand. It's hard to get, you know, it's hard to tell someone, well, I can't work for three days because I can't move. Oh, what's wrong? Well, the pain is so excruciating. I literally can't move. And you can't show people a scar and there's no, there's no, there's no wound. So it just becomes very difficult. So that led me down the path of, I'm going to figure this out myself. And that's when I started looking after hours and hours of research. I'm sort of a research nerd by, by nature. I started to find the whole food connection. And I come from a family that has always cooked. Uh, my grandmother in, in Delhi is famous for her cooking. My mother's an incredible cook. We, we always eat at home. So the issue wasn't processed food so much, but really... I started to understand that what I ate was really important to managing how I felt. And then after that, I went into, well, it's not just what I eat, it's how it was grown and how it was produced. And that led me down the path of understanding that actually how our food is produced has effects on the the ocean, the soil, the air that we breathe. And then it's not just what I'm eating, it's the products I'm using, the paint on my walls, the detergent in my laundry machine and that's just it just cat it just kind of dominoed into everything and why did you move into media because there's lots of things you could have you could have become a health coach or what have you what um, drew you to starting an impact media platform so when i discovered all this stuff i changed how i lived and so at the time this is almost 10 years ago in hong kong it was really difficult to make certain choices, to live. I went through a phase where I was, I was raw vegan, um, gluten-free, all of this, tried everything, you know, just to see what would work. And all of these lifestyle choices were difficult. And then I wanted to start eating only organic. And this is, and before I was uh, plant-based, I 
I wanted to eat only kind of wild seafood and, and humane meat and all that. And all of this was really difficult to find and difficult to procure. So I ended up creating this list of what I called my little green book. And eventually I thought, well, other people might need this. So that's how Green Queen was born. I just oh, okay. decided to share it as a blog with a list of kind of, oh, this is where I found this. This is where I found this. And this is a cute restaurant where you can find this chef and she's making everything from scratch. And this is an organic farm I love. And that's how it started. And there was absolutely no plan to have a media company or be in media. It was, I didn't even use the word media. I just thought, oh, I have a blog. And I didn't really think about it much, kept on with my day job. And then a couple of years later, um, when my co-founder and I decided to create Eco Warehouse, which is also born from my desire to make safe food more accessible to businesses, because I do believe I'm a pragmatist. I don't know if that's because I grew up surrounded by the Cantonese who are an incredibly practical minded people. I feel that business can help create change. And I feel like we need big scale change. We don't need tiny little pockets. We, we also need big movements. And so I felt that for me, it does come down a little bit to economics and business and choices for consumers and businesses. And so the, the impetus to launch Eco Warehouse was, okay, I, I really, really believe in this organic agricultural stuff. I think that organic agriculture is a huge net positive to the world, both from a human side and animal side and just like a nature environment side. And so I want to make it more accessible because at the time when I started, organic food was, was a very small industry and very, very expensive. So the only way I could think of to make it more accessible and make it easier for people to source organic was to create this platform where you could find all the organic suppliers in the world. Got it. So when we went on the journey to launch that, um, we looked at my Green Queen blog and we realized that actually I had amassed a small but dedicated and consistent following and that I actually turned out I had a quite good SEO for a lot of terms. And of course, two years after I started, there had started to be more of a movement towards health and nutrition. And it, it's, it's quite interesting to, to think about the evolution of kind of sustainability and health, because I would say if I look at what my readers wanted in 2013, they wanted everything to do with health and nutrition right? It was all about my personal health and how do I improve? Whereas today we've moved towards, no, no, no. I need to know how I can lessen my impact on the planet. Brilliant. I love that. I love how you've yeah, explained that. And I love that it grew out of a blog and that you had no plans for this. I think that's always nice for people to hear because sometimes people think, oh, you've got to have this exact, you know, vision and business plan. And, and you know, sometimes the most successful things do come out of um, happening organically, uh, pun intended. Um, so tell us a little bit about the challenges then when you, when you first started to set up Green Queen as a media outlet and also with Eco Warehouse. Talk us through some of your initial challenges and how you overcame them. So if we, so sure, of course. So if we look at Green Queen, you know, when we decided, so in, 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 in basically in early 2014, we just, we, we saw the numbers, we realized Green Queen had a master following and we realized that there was something there. And I, even though I never wanted a career in media, if you look at my childhood, it kind of makes sense. I started a magazine when I was eight years old in primary <laughs> school. I said, I used to print it out at my mom's office on, on a photocopy. And then when I was in high school later, I was an editor on the school paper. And I started a, a magazine called Peace of Mind that was all about um, ethical issues, especially around the free Tibet movement, because that was very big in the late 90s when I was in high school. So I think there was always something there about me and publishing, but for some reason, I never thought about it professionally. But so when, when we saw that Green Queen had traction, we thought, okay, Blogs are great, but to be honest, I wanted to have more than just my voice. I wanted to create something. That's when I really thought, okay, let's transition it to a media. Let's commit to a, a newsletter every week with new content every week. And at the time, that was just three articles a week. That was the best I could do. And let's start looking really at what people want and expand our coverage to really showing, you know, what's going on in food, what's going on in beauty, like what does a life that is greener and kinder and healthier look like? And let's provide news and resources and guides. 
And as I mentioned earlier, that was really related around health. So the challenges included, I had never um, run a social media page. I had never written three articles a week. I remember one of the biggest challenges at the time was how do we get a photo that looks nice for the article? And how do we not pay for it? Mm -hmm. And not have to kind of, and how do we do interviews, you know, without taking up so much, so much time? Cause we had our, our day job, which was, you know, building eco warehouse. So the challenge was really like, how, how do we learn all these tools? I also had to learn about more about WordPress and I had to learn about branding and I had to learn about, uh, you know, using MailChimp and, um, how Facebook pages worked and, and then came Instagram, which I, I personally found really challenging. I'm more of a words person. I'm not a natural born photographer. Same. Yeah. <laughs> and I still like to read. I know it's super old fashioned, but mm-hmm. I like reading. Um, and so just kind of the big challenge was learning everything and, and really also t- spending a ton of time on SEO and data, which I loved, but I was learning like using Google analytics, using search console, trying to understand, okay, what are people searching for? What can we provide them? Because we had zero marketing budget and we had zero team. So this is something we were doing almost on the side as a hobby. And then the, the biggest challenge was really learning how to think of it as a business because I always saw it as this side thing. And then I started getting speaking opportunities. And then I start, we started doing, we created the first um, health and, and wellness kind of a farmer's market in Hong Kong called Made in Hong Kong. And we reunited all the local artisans in the space that were doing raw vegan and plant-based and, and, and all of this juices and all that. And that really put us on the map. Um, and that really grew our email database. And that's when things really took off. And so all of this stuff, you know, it just, it wasn't something I knew how to do, but Green Queen just kept getting bigger. And I just, it took me about two years to really go, wait, I'm not just running Eco Warehouse. I'm running two businesses. Right, right. I, I was really, sorry, I was really reluctant to assume that, that title. Interesting, interesting. Now, it's interesting you're talking about running it as a business, monetizing, and I know you and I were having a bit of a chat before we did this recording, monetizing of media can be quite challenging um, because people expect free content. So it can be quite tricky to have, you know, the paywall and and what have you. So how have you managed to monetize uh, Green Queen? I mean, I I believe you have some advertising slots available on the website. Are there any other ways that you you monetize? So that was another big learning curve is because we didn't didn't launch it with that. It it was both a good thing and and kind of a learning curve that we didn't launch it with this idea to make money because as a result, the content turned out to be incredibly informative and and authentic and real because we weren't going, well, this is what advertisers are going to like. And I didn't come from a media publishing background. So I didn't have that little kind of what would an advertiser like demon sitting on my, on my shoulder. (laughs) So, um, (laughs) so, but we immediately started getting uh, people writing and saying, Hey, how can we work with you? And can you send us your media kit? And I, you know, never, didn't even know what a media kit was. Had to Google it and then spend the next two days create frantically creating a media kit. Obviously now our media kit is produced by our in-house designer who's amazing. But at the time I was really, I mean, just making it up and really trying to figure out, okay, well, we have this many, this much traffic. And the other thing is we were just a bit too, we were so honest because we were so green in the, in the industry. And I was very, you know, I'm going to tell the truth about how many followers I had and I'm not going to inflate anything. And so I had no idea the value of that. Right. And, and, and if I'm really honest, one of the reasons I think I didn't assume the green queen media title more or earlier and take it more seriously as a business is because I think I had kind of internalized this messaging that isn't as big now, but at the time, it's almost 10 years ago, that, you know, oh, a woman in lifestyle media, it's not serious, you know, which is not true at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I had internalized this kind of messaging. Yeah. And, you know, now I'm really angry at myself that I internalized it because now I'm, I'm incredibly proud of having built an independent media company with no money, no staff, you know, and, and now, you know, we have even major investors that write to me all the time reading our content. So 
it's just, but I didn't, I didn't take it as seriously as I should have. I love and that. I, I think that's thought, really important for people to hear that. I love that. I love that you're being honest about this kind of thing. And, and I really don't want to come across like I think there's anything wrong with being a media because I actually now love my job so much and it's brought everything to my life. But I just didn't, I didn't give myself the respect and I didn't give the space the respect that it should have. Because, yeah. you know, there's this kind of like, and for many years, people just kept referring to it as a blog. Mm-hmm. And now today I really, I, I correct people. And I go, we're not a blog. We're a media platform. It's not my voice on there. It's, you know, I'm the editor. It, there's, you know, there's a difference, but you know, there's this kind of, I don't know. I don't know if, if I were a man, if I would have had the same kind of put down effect, but so that, that's really where, where the challenge came. But one day it really just clicked. It really just clicked. I started to get much bigger advertisers. Companies from Australia started to contact me. I started to get speaking opportunities in major forums. Corporates wanted me to come see them. And this is, you know, without even trying to be a speaker, it just happened. And I think people really started to associate me with as a, as a real kind of expert, which, yeah. you know, we're never, I'm a lifelong learner. There's no expert, you know, but that is when I realized, wait, this is really, I built something here. And now I do feel there's a certain kind of, uh, you know, and I don't know if this is just, you know, pride speaking, but I do feel a little bit of, you know, well, I actually saw a lot of this stuff coming. I mean, we started writing about zero waste uh, seven years ago. Uh, We wrote about new wave foods beyond meat and impossible in 2016 before really there had been any mass media about it. Yeah. So in terms of the monetization, so I know that you say that the majority of your content even now is purely editorial. So you judge your pitches based on their editorial merit. Um, Whereas, you know, we're seeing a trend in other media for branded content or sponsored content. Um, So how do you, and and obviously that by by that, I mean uh, that that a company or a brand pays to have an article written Mm -hmm. and shared on social media, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. We used to call it advertorial. I think they've renamed it now, haven't they? yeah effectively native, native content exactly yeah, yeah exactly so how so is it literally mainly then advertising that kind of pays for green or makes green queen sustainable no we do do we call them featured articles and and we we, we list them as partner posts so we do have those they are a very small percentage right. of our total volume but but they do help and because we have incredibly strong seo that's usually the most requested feature, but here's how we try to differentiate. Um, Many brands come to us and say, hey, uh, I want to submit my content. We don't do that. You can't submit your content. We have to write the article and we have to be clear on, there has to be an editorial angle even for a featured article. And we work with the client because it is incredibly important for us to not lose our audience by being inauthentic. And we know our audience best. We know our numbers best. So we can say to the client, listen, this is, you know, the format of the article that we think would work. This is how to approach the subject. We usually do sort of a pre-interview with the client to kind of gauge where's that, where, where can we come in to really provide value for the reader while still obviously disclosing that it is a, a, a paid client. The other thing is we say no to a lot of people. So about once a day, I get a pitch about, you know, leather or uh, meat. Um, yeah, I have, there's this one PR lady. She will not stop sending me press releases about lobster and steak. Oh, I, no. I've asked her to stop. I've told her, you know, we only cover plant-based. That's yeah. another major decision we made that has, that other people I think would have struggled to make is that about two, three years ago, we said, we're no longer going to cover seafood and meat and dairy. That's it. It's done. That was a bold move. That was a bold move, especially for an existing business. I love that. I love that. And we, we, what I basically said to myself is I said, look, there's enough media that cover meat, seafood and dairy. We're going to be different. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, that cost us for sure. I I would say I, I didn't look at it that way, but for sure it cost us advertisers. Because we had a big niche as like as a as a place for people to come to find where to get uh, you know sustainable seafood yeah, and yeah. Uh, you know humane beef and antibiotic free chicken, but it, it it was a decision that really mirrored my journey, 
And That's when awesome. I realized, when I educated myself, as I said, I'm a lifelong learner. I learn more every day. When I realized that actually, I don't think I really believe there is sustainable seafood. I think all seafood is, is a serious problem. I don't really think we should be eating beef at all. I don't think that eggs are acceptable based on how they're, you know, when I realize all those things, yeah, I just felt, well, I can't feel that and then be promoting it. Got it. And in so, terms, yeah. In terms yeah. of growing it, you mentioned it started out as you and now you've got a team. How did you know when to hire your first paid, say, writer or member of staff and, and then on from that? Like, how do you know you were ready? Because obviously staff costs, uh, you know, it can be quite a drain on a business. That can be quite a large expense for a company and particularly, you know, a media company. So how did you kind of know you were ready and uh, to, to kind of... That's a team? great question. I'm not Thank sure you. if I... <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a really good question because I struggled with it for years for two reasons. One, because I was not sure... I wasn't totally sure what my next plan was. And so what most people don't know is until a year ago, it was just me. Really? Wow. Okay. Wow. And then what happened is. But you I had other decided, writers though, didn't you? Or were you writing all the content? I had one part-time writer, oh, one but, time. okay. but, but uh, she was part-time, but I did not have anyone in social. I, I hired my first person Last year, she was she she was gonna do. She's a she's an incredible member of the team. We have a very small team. There's actually only three of us that work on Green Queen, as well as one fellow who's been with me for many years who helps me sometimes with the tech. But otherwise, it's myself, Sally, the writer, and Anna, who does our, who she's our community manager, and she also helps with sales, and she also does design because she just loves design and is amazing. Um, but other that's it. That's, that's it. It's just the three of us. So it, it's a small team because that's what I believe in paying people. Yeah. I don't believe in gig workers. And okay. to be honest, I just so don't they're actually So they're employees then? They're not like that's freelance right. contract as well? Okay. Nope. They are employees. They have benefits. They have paid annual leave. They oh. get raises. They, we celebrate their birthdays. Like they are part of the family and they have job security. And they are not commission based. So they feel like, you know, a lot of uh, media here, what they do is they don't pay any base salary. It's all commissions. Oh, so if, wow. For example, in the past three months, you would have had people with no earnings. Gosh. I, I just don't, I'm not comfortable with that. I mean, I'm barely comfortable with an intern, you know, and I feel like they, I, I will only take on an intern if I feel like we can provide them incredible learning opportunities and we'll cover food and transportation or something like that. But I just, I don't see why people should work for free. Wow. And so, I'm not going to, I'm not going to fight for ethics in the media if I'm not going to provide that. I love that. So team. do they work from home remotely then or are they working, come to work in your No, office? no, no. We have a, we have an office, obviously oh, for the last three months, there yeah. has been a lot more working from home. So we were actually working in the office right up until the middle of March when uh, the second wave hit and then uh, it really there was a big push in Hong Kong for everyone to work from home if they could. So they, they worked from home. And then last two weeks we've been back in the office because um, it's, it's safe to do so. But I also have a very flexible arrangement. So one of our team members really prefers to work at home. So she stays mostly at home and comes in only once or twice. So for me, and, and for example, she has a different time zone, uh, not time zone. She just, she wakes up at four in the morning. So she finishes early. So I just, I really believe in flexibility. I believe in giving people the space, the tools and the, the, the kind of support they need to, to provide to, for them to work their best. So how did you decide then you were ready to take on, especially now I know they're employees as well. How did you, cause that's a big decision to make. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, the other, the other part of that decision is that for years I really struggled to find people who I felt were good writers and, and not just good writers, but had the same writing values as I do, which is a ton of research rather than just recycled content. Um, someone who, who is going to have that, that fair and ethics minded approach. So I really wanted to find someone that had the same kind of investigative ethics kind of 
side that I have, which is like, what's, what, whose agenda is this? And you know, what, what's going on here? And like, and you know, what's the framing of this story and are we framing it right? And what, what do we get when we share this rather than just kind of, Oh, these are five reasons to be vegan, you know, which there's enough of that. Mm -hmm. And that's great. We need that. We need, we need that type of content. But what we, what was really missing for me is content that was really smart and, and real and long form and research and backed up by, 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 by facts as, as best as we could find them. And, and, and that was really, I felt missing in the Asian median landscape in English for sustainability and health. I felt that sustainability and health were very kind of packaged with a bow in a lifestyle way. And I wanted an, a reporting way to do it. And so, um, it, it, it was kind of also chance because Sally kind of found me. So she actually begged me for an internship. And the first time I said, no, (laughs) (laughs) that's true because I just thought, well, I can't take on an intern and, you know, she doesn't have any actual experience. She's, she's young. And, and then she, she came back and she said, look, let me give it a go. And I assigned her her first story and she came back and I just called her. I, I, I know I remember I told my husband that day, I said, I found the person. She, this, 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 this woman is meant to be a writer. She's meant to be a reporter. She, she's, she's the one. Yeah. So in terms of once you made that decision, it was more or less kind of looking at, okay, this is the income that's coming in. I can afford to hire this full-time staff member. It, it was scary because I had just, I had hired the, the community and, and marketing manager and this was going to be the second hire. And I just thought, but, but the good news is when I made the decision that I was going to mm-hmm. hire Sally, it was in March and she was finishing up at London School of Economics. And so she wasn't going to be able to start till August. So I got a few months to prepare and to get my situation. Wrong. But I will say this, Green Queen has always made money. And very honestly, it has made money without ever having a dedicated salesperson. We have always had everyday inquiries to work with us. We don't say yes to everything yeah. because as I said, we, we wouldn't work, but, and, and not, not all the inquiries pan out, but. That's interesting. Green- and you think that's mainly because of your strong SEO predominantly. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we receive early on, we, we were basically getting 3 million digital impressions a month on Google search. Wow. That's amazing. So that's not, that doesn't mean we had 3 million visitors. I no. want to be clear. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. that type of, I, I think, I think people don't realize what that branding can do for you, but there, there really was this association that, okay, green queen, climate change, green queen, plant-based, green queen, vegan, green yeah. queen, sustainability, green queen, wellness. And so it's self-selected people. I'm just curious how you managed to do green queen and eco warehouse, which is like its own Thing. And obviously there's a membership involved for the suppliers that want to be involved in that. But how do you, curious how you manage to do both? <laughs> well, I mean, I think I'm a, I'm a s- severe workaholic. <laughs> so I, won't li- I won't lie about that. I'm not someone who's going to say to you, oh, you know, I only work from 10 to 4 and then the rest of the time I'm, I'm with my family. No, no, no. I, I, I work, when, you know, I get up, spend some time with, I have a little son. He's 19 months, oh. um, spend a little time with him. And then it's like to work right away and then come home maybe between six and seven, spend time with him, have dinner, maybe go for a walk. And then I work all the way till, till, you know, midnight. And then, and, and that also involves reading because you cannot do what I do and not read a ton. Uh, that's really important. So yeah, I'm, I'm a workaholic. Uh, I have systems. I have an incredible team. I think it's all, I really do think it's all about having systems. And I'm kind of one of those people that feels like the more busy you are, the more you accomplish. Okay. I don't know if you feel that. Um, yes and no. In the past, like, cause I've had, like when I, when I left one of my the dream job that I had, the GFC here, 
and I was let go. And so, and it really impacted my identity and, uh, you know, I was devastated. So I immediately started this media outlet myself. I called it the scavenger and it was basically, you know, stories that you won't otherwise hear. And it was mainly kind of social justice. So I I was doing full-time freelancing. Then I would come home, have my dinner, then I would work on this. But I did that for about two years straight and I ended up but completely burnt out, stressed, relationship wasn't working. So I know with me, I can be a bit of an all or nothing. So yes, I I think there are, I think what it is, is I think over a long period, it's not necessarily sustainable unless you, you know, you're doing some kind of self care. So I, I will say that what I didn't do before and I do do now is the weekends are off. Right. And I yes. was kind of, yes. I was kind of forced to do that because of the baby, you know? Yeah, yeah and wanting to spend time with him. But before that, it, was, it wasn't so good. Same with also, me, yeah. yeah. Also, cut out all the crap. Mm-hmm. You know, in media, you can spend a lot of time going to events and meetings and coffees and lunches. And oh, yeah. <laughs> I have to say, if you, the main reason I can do so many things, I think, is because I don't do any of that. Nice, that's good. I'm really yeah, disciplined. I, I sit at my desk as much as possible. And now a meeting or even a media opportunity or a talk, it has to be valuable. It has to be advancing the cause. It has to have a purpose. But, you know, just having coffee to talk about sustainability is something I, I'm, not, I'm not interested in that. Not yeah. because it could potentially be a great conversation, but I think what I, what I didn't do when I started this journey, because I was immature and younger and, and had a lot to learn, but what I'm really good about doing now is being very good at saying no. I'm nice. very comfortable saying no, which I wasn't for yes. years, yeah. for years <laughs> as a Same. woman. Yeah. And I felt like I had to be nice and polite. And I felt like it was rude to say no to people. That took me a really long time to, and it was other women in the industry or that I interacted with that were really strict. Like the, I remember the first time this woman said, okay, she sent me a Calendly link as a way to uh, make a meeting. And at first I went, oh my God, you know, that's so, <laughs> that's so aggressive. Like this was like five, really? six years ago. And I was like, oh my goodness. Like I, and then I thought, no, this is fierce. She mm-hmm. is respecting her time. She yeah. is valuing herself. And I wasn't doing that. I was yeah. just feeling like I had to say yes. Cause, oh, look, it's so nice that someone's taken an interest. And that's just ridiculous rubbish. I hear you. Um, I hear you. And, and then the other, but the other thing that always saves me is that I'm secretly an introvert. I like to be by myself reading and researching mm-hmm. and I don't really like going to many big parties and I don't, for, I, I like, I could, I don't think I could work in PR and go to all the events. That's just, oh, yeah. I just don't have that personality. Yeah. And so yeah. I think if you cut out all the hours you spend at events and at meetings, you can actually get a lot done. Exactly, for sure. So just to wrap up, final couple of questions. So you said a lot of the, or the majority of your content is is editorial based. Now, as we both know, you know, having worked in journalism for a long time, there are good pitches and there are bad pitches. So tell me, what do you look for uh, in a pitch that makes you say yes to running a story? That's a really good question. I think I take a little bit of a, of a, of a view that it's the topic. So if I, so a lot of what is pitched to me is very advertorially. So it's, it feels very much like a sale. That is not interesting to me. Then I move you to our marketing team. And then of course I get told there's no budget, whatever, (laughs) but I, I will not be used to promote someone's product that they could, should be paying for if they really want to promote and sell their product. So I don't want the article to feel like I'm selling. So that's what I look for in a pitch is something that is, well, here's how I look at the content on Green Queen. I I, I call it the 50-50 split of the bad and the good. So the the, the bad is, is all the news, right? Of like how the world is and what's broken and all the problems and and kind of the air pollution and the climate crisis and, and the broken food system. And, and I find that to be a very important part of what we do. And, and I, I definitely have had discussions with people where they say, oh, but it's all about being positive. And, and you know, if you, if you give people you know, the facts, they'll, they'll just feel 
no, 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 I'm not going to dumb down reality for you. And I trust that people who are engaged with the world want to know the facts and the, the bad facts. I mean, the ugly facts. But the other 50% of what I'm doing is providing inspirational, empowering content that is either featuring change makers, uh, founders, solutions, you know, like an app that allows you to, you know, plant a tree every time you buy something online. For me, that doesn't feel like a sale yeah. if I'm talking to you about that app. Whereas if I'm just telling you, you should buy this handbag because it's, it's green, that yeah. feels like a sale. Got it. So I really, yeah. I, I don't want stuff that feels like a sale. I want, you know, if you want to pitch me your founder, is it, are you willing to have a real interview where we can ask a lot of questions or is this some kind of scripted thing? Because I, I don't want to be used that way. Nice. And I will, I will say we have a long way to go on good pitches here in, 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 in Asia. I think we do in the we do in the West as well. Trust me. <laughs> really, I, I don't have as much experience there, but I just sometimes yeah. feel like you know you've got to get the commercial. And, and the, the the irony is, if the pitches were more kind of topical, they would probably get more coverage anyway. Yeah, yeah. Because at the end of the day, just like we don't want to click on the sponsored link on a Google search, we want to click on the SEO organic link. It's the same. You know, I was reading a, a fascinating article yesterday that was saying that people now look at web pages and, and cancel out the banners. Interesting. Their eyes just just don't see it anymore because they're they've just become inured to too much advertising. So they just they they cut it out yeah. visually. Yeah. And they're able to kind of measure that. I not I don't know the details, but yeah. that's what's happening. And so I have I would much rather just really work on Give, we, we, we say that at Green Queen, we inform, we inspire, and we empower in that order. So we inform you with what's going on. We empower you to feel connected to the main issues beneath the, the informative content. And then we inspire you by offering kind of guides and resources and, and solutions. And, you know, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get people to go, oh, I'm going to change my behavior. Oh, I'm going to change my office behavior. Oh, I'm going to I'm going to go and try and work in the field because I want to do something good for the, for the planet. That's what I'm trying to do. That's why I say that we're impact media. We're not just news media. Nice. I like that. Wonderful. I love that. And some very good tips. That's basically what I teach people as well. It's like, take off your business owner hat. It's not a journalist's job to do PR for you. That's your, your publicist's job. But uh, so those are really ah. good tips. So I'm glad if people will hear that. So finally, tell us about your, your long-term vision then both for yourself and for your brands. So we're at a very exciting moment for Eco Warehouse because after a bit of kind of reshuffling, I've, I've, I've started to work with a new, um, a new partner and we're just going for fundraising because we really want to pivot to be e-com B2B rather than just matching. And we're going to be expanding into all green products. Wow. So we really want to become the destination Right now, we, we already are the place where people go to look for organic suppliers, but we want to be the place where people go to look for bio and plant packaging, for reusables, for plant-based, um, all verified and certified and, and, and kind of in-house checked, which is, which is our yes. MO with Eco Warehouse. And I'm not looking to do everything. I'm looking to do the best quality stuff that, is, that, that, that can be trusted. Um, so that's exciting. So we're, we're literally about to start on that fundraising journey now and, and we're putting together an, an incredible advisory board and just, and just really going for it. So that's going to be a whole new chapter and really take me big into the eco warehouse uh, world. And then I think with green queen about when, when Sally joined and when I started hire, when, when I started hiring the team, that's when I also made the decision that, okay, we want to be Asia wide we want to start really having a much bigger volume of content and we want to increase our numbers. And so that's really been working. So now we're at, you know, one and a half million readers a quarter, which is huge, huge uh, increase since January. Um, you know, now the numbers are getting quite, quite big and, and good, like numbers that really are meaningful, which means that we can make more impact. And so now the question is, you know, what's going to be our identity going forward. And, and we've been playing with that for the last few months. And, and some of the stuff we've been doing is really paying off. So it takes a while. Once you go from producing 20 articles a month to over a hundred, it takes a while for that to really um, become, you know, for the fruits of that labor to pay off. And that's finally happening now. 
For sure. Has Green Queen, just finally, how has Green Queen been funded and, and also Eco Warehouse? Is it through investors or has it literally been organic through the advertising? So Green Queen has, as I said, from the beginning, other than our time, which was never accounted for, which you should always account for your time. <laughs> but so that part was just, I gave my time and I, I still do for Green Queen. But uh, Green Queen was a, has always been able to survive off advertising and then events. We do do events. We right. have a very popular, obviously they're all on hold. Yeah. But we have, for, for example, we have an amazing UNSDG plant-based dinner series, um, which we started. So we've done five. So it's whereby we, um, we work with a restaurant that's an Omni restaurant and we challenge them to create a vegan menu. And then we invite an NGO that is working on a specific SDG to give a short 20 minute talk to the guests before they eat. And so we combine raising awareness about SDGs, highlighting local NGOs and convincing restaurants that they have a, they have a, a, a market that they're not hitting, which is the vegans and the plant-based people. And out of the all five events were sold out. And three of the restaurants actually created permanent vegan menus as a result. Wow. That's amazing. I love so that. That's what, so we, we were supposed to have our next one in January. We tried to move it to February and then we realized, okay, it's not happening. Yeah, yeah. Um, with Green Queen, we also launched into a new side, which is Green Queen Biz, which is our B2B side for Green Queen. So it's a membership sustainability community. You could look at it kind of like a member, like a sustainability chamber of commerce. And so we reunite businesses now in Hong Kong, but starting to look at Asia, um, where we kind of bring them together, provide match, personalized matchmaking, uh, help them connect with uh, corporates. It, the whole point is the UNSDG partnerships, uh, UNSDG 17, the goal for partnerships for the goals. So how do we help advance the goals by getting these startups and SMEs, the connections and, and matches they need with bigger corporates who are also looking for solutions, but they're basically not finding each other. So we created this platform. So we have an app and we have 30 members. And this just started in January and it's, it's really doing well. And I have a special uh, team. One of my colleagues, I will, she runs that. So she's in charge of all that. Wow. Um, but for Eco Warehouse, it was uh, my savings. It, 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 it was funded by me. And now with what we want to do, we're going out for, for, prop, for a seed round. Amazing. Wonderful. Wow. So impressed with everything you're doing. And you shared some wonderful tips. And I really love your honesty. I think, you know, sometimes when people see successful people, you know, kind of, you know, doing their dream jobs and being successful, they, they, they sort of just think, oh, it's easy or, you know, they must have had a plan and all the rest of it. Whereas I, I love that you've been honest about where you come from. And yes, sometimes you've got to be a workaholic and, and everything. So um, been really wonderful um, speaking with you, Sonali. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be honest and really share. I really value it. So that was Sonali Figueras from Green Queen and Eco Warehouse. You can find out more at greenqueen.com.hk and ecowarehouse.com. And that's eco spelled E-K-O. And those links are on the show notes page at veganbusinessmedia.com forward slash podcasts and going to episode 143. So that's it for this episode of Vegan Business Talk. I hope you enjoyed it and found it useful. If you like the show, please give it a review on iTunes or whatever platform you're listening on as it helps to get it seen by more people. There are more free resources on the veganbusinessmedia.com website to help you in your quest to build and sustain a successful business. And if you'd like to work with me personally on promoting and growing your vegan business or brand, you'll find details on how to do this on the website at veganbusinessmedia.com and clicking on the Work With Me menu link. Thank you so much for tuning in and I look forward to catching up with you on the next episode of Vegan Business Talk. Bye for now.